Well, you know, as a precaution, since we're having some technical duty uh, difficulties here, Johnny, can I borrow you for a second? Sure. Got to do the Vulcan mind meld. Okay. I'm going to download my slides directly into your head, sure. just in case anything goes wrong. So, you ready? <laughs> so, we we got back up now. <laughs> I really appreciate the warm welcome. You know, you can watch TED Talks forever, at least I can. Um, but the energy that you get with, by being with the people that are doing the talking and the energy you get from the people in the room that are receiving the information is phenomenal. So thank you for encouraging and inspiring all of us so far today. Um, I've set myself up with a very unenviable burden here. Um, I am going to try and talk to you about beer, get you excited about beer, yet I haven't a drop of beer to share with you right now. So this could be a very, this could be a strategic, a grave strategic error. Um, there is a gentleman in the vestibule selling rotten tomatoes, uh, sharpened pitchforks, and pre-lit torches. So if, <laughs> if you got to bring your worst at me, let's get it done. Um, you know, as a student, hmm, I see. <laughs> As a student looking forward to puberty, I'm glad it's finally happened. As a student of Temple University's Tyler School of Art in 1983, here locally, just outside of Philadelphia, I was blissfully unaware that my newfound favorite beverage, beer, was in a serious state of affairs. Um, because in 1983, American brewing scene had dwindled from a peak of uh, 1,400 breweries opened in the United States uh, prior to the prohibition in 1919 and had dwindled down to 80 breweries active, run by only 51 companies here in the United States in 1983. But, you know, I could still get 40 ounce bottles of Genesee cream ale and Stroh's and such, so I was sad. I didn't, you know, concern myself with such difficulties. And part of it was at that time in my life, and many of us have been through this as well. Having access to undifferentiated products is actually somewhat liberating. You don't care about flavor because you've actually never had flavor before. Um, and then you can make the more critical decisions a college student does, like, well, which one's cheapest? <laughs> so this was where I was coming from. But my affiliation with beer um, really took a dramatic turn for the better in 1984 when I took a trip to Southern California to visit my best friend, at the time, um, he's been my best friend since 1973. He's my business partner today. Ron and I had met on a school bus uh, again in 1973 when we were 10 years old, again locally in Montgomery County in this area. Um, but out there in California, his dad had gotten some beer from Oregon called uh, Henry Weinhardt's. And we, uh, <laughs> yeah, see, whoop, the mind meld's working. Um, <laughs> So we had drank some Henry Weinhardt's, and the, the, the flavor in that cool liquid was something that we had never experienced before. And it really set us off on a path of discovery that still continues today. Um, the last 15 years of our lives, he and I have been, well, I'm giving ourselves a couple extra months because our, our brewery anniversary is in February. But for 15 years now, we've been running and operating our own brewery in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, in an old uh, abandoned Pepperidge Farm factory. So um, I think that you know my personal journey in this world of beer making actually has a tale to tell in the larger social aspects of how beer has been sort of uh, reimagined here in the United States. And, and I'm here to tell you how right here and right now that American brewing is in a tremendous state of innovation on a tremendous upward climb. And I think that significantly part of that success has to do with the right here, right now aspects of Philadelphia, because Philadelphia has really been very supportive in numerous ways that I hope to, uh, to go through here with you. A um, couple of the brands that uh, hadn't survived. This is sort of the moment of silence portion of the presentation. <laughs> uh, oh, no, you, you, can, you can laugh if you wish. Um, Ortlieb's. Joe Ortlieb's come, Joe Ortlieb comes by our brewery now and again. He's a tremendous guy, and it really is, he finds it very invigorating to come into an active brewery and see how things are working. Ah, there's the trick. No, it went too far. Okay. If it looks like I'm aiming at you, I'm not. You know, to bring things sort of home to a certain extent, um, here in the Northern Liberties of Philadelphia, actually, perilously close to an operation I'm going to talk about later in my talk is this marker, this historical marker. 
Uh, this will really sort of set the tone for what Philadelphia has, has done. You probably have heard the stories about how our founding fathers and the framers of the Constitution were actually a bunch of luscious who would get together in Philadelphia taverns and drink a lot of British ale and complain about tyranny and then go out and write some, some tremendous documents. Well, that was where Philadelphia got its start in beer. But uh, in 1840, a Bavarian immigrant by the name of John Wagner brought some yeast from his home, Germany, and was able to utilize it in producing the first lager beer here in the United States. So really this was a stylistic shift that ensued here with this uh, first brewing of lager beer because we went from the colonial ales that we were accustomed to to something that was sort of uh, lighter and, and a whole new style and it was really embraced wholesale across the United States and really began to roll. Some of the names that I showed you before were names of prestigious brewing families that had evolved into dynasties as beer was beginning to be produced by uh, these larger entities. And of course, these innovators in lager beer brewing made full use of some of the technological advances they had at hand, like refrigeration, uh, rail uh, transportation in order to get their pro products to further environments. And so bit by bit, brewing was moving from a craft inexorably towards an industry. And of course, timing-wise, this is what was happening across the United States as well. Fortunately, there was a thirst here in the United States that warmly embraced all of this beer. Uh, in 1915, per capita, our forebears were drinking 18.7 gallons per year, and uh, that number dropped after Prohibition, 1935, to only 10.3 gallons uh, per year. So you can see how socially some things changed a lot. Um, you know, still, if we take a look at this slide, we get a real good sense of, of how this production began to change. Brewing becomes an industry. There was still growth in terms of the number of breweries from 1865 to 1875, but then the decline began. And uh, so you can look at the production as well. 3.7 million barrels of beer produced in 1865 to 59.8 uh, million barrels of beer produced. So really what we saw in a 50 year period here was that even though the number of active breweries shrank by 40 percent, we had a 16 time uh, increase in the actual amount of beer produced. So I think that's a tremendous illustration of uh, what happens when industry takes hold. There was a big thing that happened between this, sli this slide and the previous one and that was called prohibition. Uh, because the tavern owners and the consumers of beer, there was perceived and real excesses that occurred. And prohibitionists seized upon this after a real long struggle on October the 10th of 1919. The Volstead Act was approved by Congress. It survived uh, President Wilson's veto and went into effect. Brewers and distillers suddenly found themselves looking for a new line of work, more or less. So you can see some of the trends that occurred in terms of the numbers there. Um, the breweries that did survive prohibition, most of them were producing uh, malt syrup, malt extract at the time, ostensibly for the baking industry. Um, but I think history will tell you that there was an awful lot of foamy bathtubs in people's basements in America at that time. Um, some of the breweries that survived also went into ice making, ice cream, and again, rail and transportation services in order to survive. Other factors occurred as well that actually diminished the character of American beer. Um, we had rationing during two world wars, so malted barley was at a premium. Corn and rice were more plentiful. They lessened the body of beer. Um, brewers found themselves brewing for a different audience. A lot of men were out of the country, some never to return. And the six-pack actually was an invention during the Second World War, mindful of the fact that a lot of the consumers were the GI housewives who weren't really going to schlep home a case of 24 when maybe only six would do. So many things were happening during this time period and basically beer was just getting lighter and lighter throughout the process. Let me just gather myself here. So in the 70 years that we've got recounted here, you can see that we've lost 93% of the American breweries. We got ourselves down to 101 breweries in uh, 1980, and as I'd said, we were down to actually 80 breweries in 1983. Now bear in mind that um, 
at the very low point, 1983, was only 10 years after the fact that light beer first commercially hit the market. And I think light beer really stands as a perfect illustration of just how little character people will tolerate in a product that they call beer. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm speaking personally. I think you know, that's quantifiable that there's no character there. So after the low point, what happens? Well, you've got very constricted choices, very constricted options for the consumers. And we as consumers really don't like that. We like diversity. We like plentiful uh, prospects. What it really had occurred there was that there were uh, some home brewers and some consumers who decided and were encouraged to get into the business of making beer on a very small scale level because the options that they really wanted to enjoy simply didn't exist. So you sort of had this craft cottage industry bubbling up, fermenting up, if you will, from people that were rather frustrated with uh, their options. So breweries start to open. And here we see the most recent snapshot of that. Uh, we're basically ticking along through three years here at adding about 50 craft breweries per year. But then over the last 12-month period, we've added 100 craft breweries. So this trend is really accelerating, is what we've got going on now at this point. And in terms of where, whoops, getting ahead. <laughs> The projector's been drinking. <laughs> In terms of where the market share is coming from, I thought that this was sort of a curious statistic. Um, contract breweries versus craft breweries and brew pubs. Contract breweries are breweries that farm out, outsource their beer production to uh, breweries, typically of a larger scale, that have the capacity. And you can see that their share of the craft marketplace has been shrinking rather rapidly uh, over a period of time. That really is driven by the fact that a lot of these um, contract brewers have been encouraged to become bricks and mortars brewers. They've tested their idea, and it's actually working. But I think in, in the larger scheme of things, it shows you that the industrial approach is not really working, and that the authenticity and integrity of producing something with your hands and rolling up your sleeves is working for these, these businesses. So I think I've illustrated here that craft brewing is on an upward trend uh, pretty significantly, and American breweries are rebounding. Why is this so? I love this phrase from Garrett Oliver, a friend of mine who is a brewmaster at the Brooklyn Brewery, and he's written a wonderful book called The uh, Brewmaster's Table that really goes into the pairings of beer and food so succinctly. And Garrett says, actually I'll give you his entire quote, things that were real, bread, cheese, beer, get made into facsimiles by technological means. And now, Renaissance. The bread aisle is full of real bread, and bakeries begin to open. Cheese aisles are full of real cheese, and village cheese shops open, and beer becomes real again. Therefore, the craft brewing movement is not a fad. It's a return to normality. That fad was fake food and fake beer, and that fad is over. <laughs> That's, the takeaway from that is I really should claim Garrett's uh, statements as my own going forward. <laughs> uh, he's a genius. So Garrett, as always, is spot on correct with this because, like myself, he has lived through this. He's worked through it as a producer of full-flavored beers and a consumer of full-flavored foods. He's been in the middle of it all. And I think that his statement was actually further reinforced by something I caught in the Washington Post in August of this, this past year. Um, there was an article demonstrating that um, packaged wheat bread had finally surpassed packaged white bread sales for the first time in the United States. And this was like, oh man, all the white bread haters. <laughs> the statement that was made by the Post was, in this new world of pandemic connoisseurship, love that phrase, there is no place for standard supermarket white bread, hence the unhappy white bread. Um, but you know, really I think the, the damning phrase here is standard because fewer and fewer people are, are making their food choices looking for standard um, when they could have pastured, organic, locally grown. Um, so I mean, standard just isn't what anyone as a consumer is going for at this point. 
In Philadelphia, it may be a little bit unique, where our taste buds may be a little bit more discerning. I found a fact that the uh, Census Bureau in 2008 discovered that of all food retail operations in the United States, the national average is 22% of them on the national average are what are considered specialty food stores. The Philadelphia average was 29%, and some counties, Bucks and, uh, and Delaware County, were registering close to 40%. So maybe we're a little bit more discerning here as well. Which brings us back to Philadelphia, the right here part. Um, two friends, I guess similar to, to Ron and I at a time, um, a brewer and a restaurateur opened up a tavern in 1999. Um, this is the Standard Tap in the Northern Liberties. Uh, fairly challenging, <laughs> sure. a fairly challenging neighborhood at the time, and um, you know it was Philadelphia's first gastro pub, the first place that really put food and drink on par and said these are equal components of one thing that's very important to us. And even though the operation has won national and, and regional acclaim, it's sort of surprising that their beer menu has been constricted, limited, uh, to beers that are only from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Um, when quizzed about this, one of the principals had said, the idea of beer as food is so intrinsic to our approach that it is actually easy to miss. At the standard tap, we purposely limited the size of our food and beer menus. We did this because we have a passion for things to be their best. And that's really what it's come down to. It's getting the best from both beer and food and bringing them together into a singular experience. And the Standard Tap is certainly not alone in this. They make a great illustration of the point. Uh, this ethic has been embraced by countless restaurants throughout Philadelphia and throughout the country. This is why we have 1,600 breweries now active. So with that combination, of food and beer on the same level, what we've been able to do is take beer away from being just a fizzy yellow intoxicant and bring it into a whole new level of appreciation. And for that reason, I think beer has, American beer has a very bright future ahead of it. And I'll say cheers to that. Thank you.